I want to thank uh, Jens Niebaum and Francesco de Teodoro for inviting me to this, and of course the Herziana and the Academia di San Luca for their hospitality. Uh, the title of this lecture, as you see, is Tectonica. Well, I just want to start this machine. It's a special edition of Apple, and it gives me a shock. If I go more than 55 minutes, it's made for scholars. It's a special, special edition you get in, in New York. Tectonicon and surface scape, architecture in the body in the pre-modern. I'm aware that my lecture may be a bit puzzling, a lecture title, especially the unfamiliar terms tectonicon and surface scape. I hope that their meaning and relevance will become clear in the course of this lecture. I assure you that I have not forgotten Bramante. Although he will be only be discussed at the end of my paper, my intention is that he will appear in a new and perhaps useful light. Although this lecture concerns broad questions of architectural perception, it, I did not begin with a study of aesthetics. Rather, the ideas emerged from a research project that focused on the authorship of a single Renaissance building. It was through the question of its authorship that I was led to reconsider the relationship of the body and building in pre-modern architecture to devise the categories of tectonicon and surface scape and to explore some of their implications for Renaissance architecture. It is this train of thought that I will explain to you today. The building that I begin with is the Pazzi Chapel in Florence. Prior to my research, it was regarded as the defining work of Filippo Brunelleschi. It was emblematic of the entire Renaissance movement and considered a high point in architectural history. Thus the chapel was made the frontispiece of the Heidenreich Lotz volume of the canonical Pelican History of Architecture in its original 1970s edition. To make sure its importance was communicated, the chapel also appeared on the box for the book. I believe it was also on the dust jacket. The chapel received very VIP treatment everywhere. As you see here in Janssen's History of Art, it is allowed an exceptional four, section, exceptional four images and so on. Thus you can understand why many people were sensitive to any questioning of Brunelleschi's authorship of the chapel as I was doing in the mid-1990s, including a lecture I gave at the Herziana with which not everyone in the audience agreed. Such sensitivity translated into shock and anger especially among some Italians, at least the Florentines, when in 1996 I published this notorious article in Casabella at the invitation of Francesco del Co. Here you see the title page with a view into the chapel vaults. Correction. Actually, this is the whole title page spread, which is double. I call to your attention that the Im image on the right shows a different building, of course, that it looks almost the same as the Pazzi Chapel is the problem. When I mention what you already know, that the right-hand building is the old sacristy in San Lorenzo, which is securely by Brunelleschi and dated 1422 to 28, you might say to yourself, a simple case of development. But actually, the quasi-doubling poses quite a conundrum, both in the doubling itself, the identity of the works, and their differences. The uncanny similarity might speak for the same authorship or against it, considering the relentless originality of an architect such as Brunelleschi. The similarity in detailing might mean repetition or imitation and so forth. To solve this puzzle would take more than one lecture, but some points are relevant to review. Not much is securely known about the history of the chapel. Even its dating involves guesswork. No architect is mentioned in the few documents that survive. The chapel is not included in Antonio Manetti's detailed 1480s biography of Brunelleschi, and the assignment of the chapel to him appears only in a later, unreliable text. Apart from the resemblance to the old sacristy, the building is believed to be by Brunelleschi mainly because Vasari said it is, and then everyone repeated it for over 400 years. Because of the relative dating, we know that the chapel derives from the sacristy. If one compares them closely, however, one finds marked stylistic differences in many details, as well as in the character of the whole. So much so that it becomes difficult to sustain Brunelleschi 
as the author of the chapel. In these two views of the sacristy is evident its powerful cubic and his hemispherical spatial geometry. This geometry is sharply delineated by the dark stone classical membrane. The proportions are clear. The load of the arches and entablature and the firm support of the pilasters is apparent and all of the elements are realized in lucid classical detail. This view emphasizes the clear geometry of the space and the forms that shape it, and the calm, lucid harmony of art entablature, arches, windows, roundels, and other details of the dark stone membrane. On the right, you see the high definition of the elements of load and support the pilasters that seemingly sustain the entablature, that support the arches, which lift the vaults. All joints and edges are de defined with great clarity. These properties are maintained close up in the definition of structural transitions, not to mention the precision of design and execution of every detail seemingly down to the pores of the stone. Here the same properties are seen on the other side of the room and the Pazzi Chapel. On the right, you observe how the pristine lucidity of the sacristy capitals have become tangled, broken, and clumsily executed in the Pazzi Chapel or capital. It is forced asymmetrically into a corner. It is impossible to reduce to a logical structure. One questions, are we seeing a single folded capital or two incomplete ones? A question impossible to resolve. In these views of the corner and upper areas of the Pazzi Chapel, one sees not only a roughness of execution, but a blurring of planes and boundaries. Except at the base of the cupola, it is difficult for the eye to determine where one plane ends and another begins. The membrane slides from one surface to the next without clearly defining edges or turns, which are hard to locate. As one area bleeds into the next in the Pazzi Chapel, the pristine organism of the old sacristy seems almost to be hemorrhaging, apart from the roughness of execution of all detail. Let's move back and look at the main walls of the building. Often the Pazzi Chapel is shown in this standard view, the one used in the Pelican volume. What it does is to make the Pazzi Chapel falsely look almost exactly like the old sacristy. But if you move back and spread your field of vision to encompass what you actually see in the Pazzi Chapel, it starts to look very different from the old sacristy. Its lucid concentration of form and structure are, is lost as the Pazzi elevation starts to diffuse in a banal lateral duplication of motifs. I would go even further. The question concerns not merely the richness of architectural experience, but its fundamental character, which is altered by a reliance on the medium of photography, and especially of digital photography. Perhaps what I'm getting at is totally obvious here, but I'm not sure about that, and so I'll try to make my point more understandable. Most import informed people would probably say that what is on the screen now is the Pazzi Chapel. Yet, it is clearly not the chapel. It's only a photograph of it. And this distinction is not trivial. Again, we're looking up at the Duomo, right? Well, of course, we're not, we're not only looking at pieces of paper on which silver images of the Duomo and its lantern and Santa Maria degli Angeli are deposited, leaving a record of the pattern of light and shade formed by the building transmitted through the camera lens onto photographic film. If the desired relationship with the building is one of empathy produced by, through embodied perception, I think it would be difficult, even for the most imaginative, imaginative and informed observer to produce that empathetic response merely from such images. Perhaps if one visited the Duomo, take a single case, and closely studied it enough times, such photographs, photographic representation of the building could trigger a memory, a learned response to the representations of structural forces and other material dimensions of architecture. 
but that would be de uh, dependent on one's having learned to produce that mode of pre-modern architectural experience initially, improbable for most people in our society. One more example. Here I will, here I, I will try to graphically illustrate just how photography, in particular digital photography, in its immateriality as pure energy and light, with not even a paper support or the palpable glow of a slide or transparency, is one step further removed from a uh, situated concrete experience. I will pursue the immediacy of how this affects architectural perception. So if I tell you this is a house in Bellport, Long Island, actually my own house, you, Hubertus has been there, <laughs> you probably will believe me, so he will believe me. <laughs> but of course it, up there on the screen, is not my house. Yet it is a convention to say this image is the object it represents. We generally forget that it is only a photograph. And here, there's not even a physical print I can hold in my hand that might produce an, an illusion of tactile connection. There is only a projected, totally dematerialized di digital image as insubstantial as the photons playing on my retina. But now, I would like you instead to accept the photographic illusionism and uncritically try to enter the image where you find me looking up intently at the house. I am looking to see if there is much peeling paint or whether the recent hurricane tore off any of the roof or trimmed the ocean being a few hundred meters away. Inside the picture, within the event itself and its memory, I imagine the experience. I am standing in the same space as the house. I am connected to it physically by the air and the breeze and by the feel and glare of the sunlight. I am standing on the same ground that the house does and in the same gravitational field that simultaneously makes the house and me heavy in the afternoon sun. I participate in and comprehend the condition of architectural empathy. Now we exit this image on the screen. We are no longer inside the picture space, but outside, watching me sitting at a desk, looking at a digital image on the computer of me looking at the house, of the same image we were just inside. It is now merely an image, the image of an image. There is no way for us to connect with the experience of standing on the ground with the house, experiencing the sun sunlight and gravity and resistance to it altogether. If the digital distancing and nullification of the somatic, empathetic experience of architecture was not clear, perhaps this sh should help, or this even more. This is the way increasing numbers of people experience not only architecture, but the world in general. In museums, I'm sure all of you have noticed those visitors who don't even look at paintings, but stride through the rooms with an acoustic guide to locate the most significant works, then snap a photo and walk on without ever having laid their naked eyes on the actual work. I couldn't resist, couldn't resist capturing this frenetic scene last time I tried to see the Italian paintings in the loop. A room filled not with tourists, but with photographic androids, cyborgs, whatever. But if you can kind of get around to the other side of this human ocean, you may find still a few absorbed, even ecstatic faces, suggesting that perhaps not all is lost. To summarize the main theoretical points that I've tried to make regarding pre-modern architecture. This analysis, first of the problematics of architectural self-representation, and then of the representation of architecture, reveals a pre-modern situation in which architecture both represents the body and engages the body in its perception of the building. Thus is set in motion 
through the shaping of architecture and the response of the human subject to it, an intense bi-directional current, as it were, between body and building. This culturally produced current did not go unrecorded in ancient and European literature. The story is most elaborately narrated by Joseph Rickwert in his immense book of 1980, which had the, most, the dancing column, where the building is body, the body as a model for the building, and the identity of body, building, and cosmos run as light motifs in practice and especially in text from Vitruvius through the 18th century. Figuring strongly in Rickward's narrative, as in parallel studies of Rudolf Wittkauer, John O'Nions, Alina Payne, and others, are Renaissance theorists, including Alberti, Filarete, Francesco di Giorgio, and on to the Cinquecento. In Alberti's architectural treatise, written around 1450, even more than in Rickward, the building is literally modeled after the bones, ligaments, and muscles of the body, just as beauty results from imitating the body's symmetry and proportions. In Filarete's treatise of 14, about 1460, the origins of architecture are traced to the moment of the expulsion of Adam from Eden, where architecture had not been necessary. But now it rains on Adam's body, and in sheltering his head from the rain with the vault of his two hands, he originates the archetype of all architecture. Filarete everywhere posits the idea, elsewhere posits the idea of a building literally as a living body, which is conceived in the union of patron and architect, who carries it for nine months, gives birth to it, and nourishes it as a living creature with entrance and exit orifices, and internal organs and structure, all needing to be attentively cared for like a child. Somewhat strange to the modern reader, perhaps, and many historians ridicule of Filarete against the more serious-sounding Alberti, but in fact, Filarete's thinking was not alien to the world of the pre-modern body. In the treatise of Francesco di Giorgio, completed around 1480, ideas and images appear that posit the most literal correspondences between building and body. On the left, the body formats both the plan and cross-section of a church. In the middle, it gives meaningful shape to a fortress, while on the right, the proportions of the profiles of, the entablature, of an entablature are made to correspond literally to the profiles of a hum, human head and body, images which I'm sure are familiar to most of you. This discourse is inevitably seen to climax in Michelangelo, whether in Cammy Brothers' recent book or in James Ackerman's classic monograph written in the late 1950s. His book remains very influential, and in view of the observations I've made today, its claims need some qualification. Ackerman described the extreme body imagery in Michelangelo's buildings as organic, a fashionable, fashionable concept in architecture culture of the 1950s. Essentially, he was describing in different terms what I call my meta-structural properties. However, rather than seeing an instance of trans-historical modality, he limits the organic to the Cinquecento and almost exclusively to Michelangelo himself. Thus, he sets Michelangelo's organically vital work in opposition to Quattrocento architecture, which he, as Pitkauer, uh, character, oh, Ackerman, pardon, ac characterizes as totally abstract in both the theory and practice. He asserts, for example, that, quote, when 15th century writers spoke of deriving architectural forms from the human body, they did not think of the body as a living organism, but as a microcosm of the universe. This entirely intellectual attempt to humanize architecture really made it particularly abstract, end quote. Ackerman entirely overlooked the trans-historical dimensions of my meadow structural architecture, as well as the building as body theory of Quattrocento writers that I discussed a few minutes ago. <clears throat> Yet his narrative of progress from abstraction to organicism was and remains widely accepted, despite such writers as Rickward, who did not directly challenge it, did not challenge Ackerman, that is. All but lost in this historiography 
was not only the building as body discourse of Quattrocento architectural practice, but that of the pre-Renaissance. Gone virtually unnoticed, for example, is not only the Northern Gothic column, but a vast tectonic and somatic representational discourse throughout Europe. It was very intense in Italy, including Tuscany. A case in point is one of the most extraordinary architectural sculptural ensembles that exist. Giovanni Pisano's pulpit of 1302 in the church of Sant'Andrea in Pistoia. Ackerman's notion of an organic architecture could not be made more explicit than the way that the unrelenting load of the pulpit deforms the kneeling figure struggling forever to keep it standing. The figure dramatically represents in organic terms that tectonic loads, the forces of load and support that pervade the assemblage. And I just point out, I, the figure, in the photograph on the left, it looks like the column on the right is floating in the air. It's the angle of the picture. Some people have said, well, why is the column floating? But the picture on the upper right, you see I, I inserted, it shows that the column is right on his shoulder. So he is lifting it, just to clarify that in case it was confusing. He is doing, the Atlas figure in Pistoia, he is doing, in other words, exactly what the Caryatids are doing in the Arctheum porch, exposing, laying bare the tectonic discourse of architectural representation throughout the entire building. Thereby, it may be said that the Pistoia figure stands midway between Athens and Michelangelo, a medieval detour, if you will. A decade later, in Giovanni Pisano's pulpit, this organic discourse advances a step toward the Renaissance, so to speak, in that the figure of Hercules, disguised as fortitude, now uncoils to an upright position and a stance that realizes an almost perfect Alantica contrapposto. A century later, in Donatello's and Michelozzo's Brancacci tomb, we find the motif elaborated, but the figures are not entirely convincing in their weight-resisting illusion. They were, in fact, among the last of their genre. Such caryatids and atlases are rare in the Renaissance. What happens during the period, as is rather well known, is that the standing human figure is freed of the guilt-laden architectural burden of carrying or being confined by the building. He or she emerges in erect, freestanding splendor in keeping with the ongoing revaluation of human existence, which is exemplified in the shift from Pope Innocent's the third canonical text of 1200 on the misery of the human condition to the mid quattrocento proclamations of John Otzo Manetti on the dignity and excellence of man in four books and Nicholas of Cusa's assertion that, quote, man is God, but not absolutely since he is man. He is therefore a human God. In the figural arts, particularly in sculpture, this salutary turn in the representation of the human image is seen so directly in the following two century sequence that my co no comment is necessary. All of this bears strongly on our architectural story because while this sculptural development was going on, the categories of both tectonicon and surface scape were at work in full force. Okay, now I will fully explain, or finally I should say, finally explain what I intend by these two terms. Tectonicon and surface scape are terms that I derived variously from the extreme discourse of ar on architect, from the extensive, pardon me, extensive discourse on architectural tectonics on the one side, and on the other from Jonathan Hay's recent book on sensuous surfaces in, that's the name of the title of the book, in Chinese decorative arts. In Hay's book, surface scape refers to a not unrelated yet distinct concept that plays a large role in his discussion. Both of my concepts involve an empathetic response to the building, different not only from Hay, but from one another. In my usage, In my usage, a tectonicon 
is a building that affirms the representation, engages and affirms the representation of the structural forces within it. This continuity and separation of manifest load and support are, are essential, that they be separated from, clearly sub distinct from one another. Components of load and support are divided and set into apparent, apparent gravitational and structural interaction. The orders are a primary template or manifestation of this modality. The key perceptual mode, its key perceptual mode is that of proprioception, the internal senses, sensing of the movement and, and, and forces in our muscles, ligaments, and bones. The human body and its structure are often a model for shaping and proportions, but need not be. These familiar buildings are all perfect examples of the tectonicon. They emphasize the components of apparent load and support, the expression and play of structural mimesis. A surface scape, to the contrary, is a building that denies or disregards the structural forces within it. Typically, it buries them beneath or within a continuous surface. This surface may have relief, but it remains intact. It is unarticulated into elements that convincingly signify structure and load and their relationship. Its key perceptual mode is that of what perceptual psychologists call exteroception, or the sensing of and by the skin. Like the skin, the surface must remain unbroken except for predetermined entrances and windows. It may acquire ornament, but in itself cannot be reduced to ornament. In the Western tradition, surface scape was not as widespread as the tectonica, but it played a very significant role in the ancient Near East outside Egypt, as well as in Byzantium. The surface scape played such a large role in Islamic architecture that I cannot even begin to document it apart from this image of the amazing palace facade from Mashata, like the Ishtar Gate, of course, now in Berlin. The surface scape also remained an important alternative in non-Islamic architecture. Neither modality can be essentialized according to region or culture. Usage, usage seems to have always been contingent, and the process can be surprising, as in the uncanny resemblance of the surface scapes of Mashata and the late 13th century facade of Siena Cathedral. Such parallelism is perhaps more widespread than imagined. Nevertheless, while surface scapes were prevalent in Islamic architecture, the tectonicon seems to predominate in Europe, certainly in the so-called Romanesque and Gothic styles. The imperial cathedral in Speyer, uh, coeval with Isfahan, the Isfahan chamber, is a stunning example of this powerful trend. Yet, to complicate the picture once again, the fan-vaulted 14th century cloister of Gloucester Cathedral not only launches the so-called perpendicular style of English Gothic, but seems to mark a regional turn toward the surface scape. Whereas on the European mainland, at least north of the Alps, the tectonic con continued to dominate the Gothic as in Peter Parler's mid-14th century choir of Gmund Cathedral in what is now southern Germany. In Trecento Florence, both modalities were in practice. This is seen dramatically at the Campanile. Its bottom stories, following Giotto's design of 1334, are pure surface scapes that flow unbroken around the building. Whereas just above, as indicated in the slide, the design of the marble revetment was reshaped by Giotto's successor, Andrea Pisano, who articulated the thin layer of marble incrustation into an illusory tectonic grid of seemingly separate layers of load and support. 
As throughout most of Europe, the dominant tradition in medieval Florence, especially for church interiors, was definitely the tectonicon. This view, view shows the relentless, almost brutalist tectonic machinery of the church of Santa Croce. 